Just to move straight to our agenda item four then, members and guests, uh, which is our Department of Education oral briefing on coronavirus response. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 11? Copy of correspondence set, sent by the committee to the department following our informal meeting last week at page 13, and correspondence from the department replying to committee queries and regarding notices made under the Coronavirus Act 2020, all of which are at tabled papers. The committee agreed to receive for formal oral weekly briefings from the department on its COVID-19 response. The Minister and the Permanent Secretary and Deputy Secretary are here to provide an oral update on the department's response to the coronavirus via audio link. And can I confirm that we have Peter Weir, MLA, the Minister for Education, Derek Baker, Permanent Secretary, Department of Education, and John Smith, Dep Deputy Secretary, Department of Education, with us uh, this morning. You're, you're very welcome. Chair, sure, yes, confirm up as Minister and Chair, Derek, uh, Permanent Secretary, but then John is also I think, um, on, on another line, but uh, all of us are available. Okay, thank you. By way of opening remarks, Minister, can I, I thank you and the Department for the work you're doing in response to COVID-19 emergency. I, I know your sincerity of your commitment uh, to this task, having spoken to you in person on a number of occasions, and, and that of your Department, and I, I thank you for that. Um, it has, however, obviously been three weeks since you were able to provide an update in person to the Assembly or the Education Committee on the COVID-19 response. And I would ask, therefore, in the course of your remarks, if you could address whether it will be possible to have a more regular uh, engagement with the Assembly and the Committee uh, during this time of such unprecedented challenge for teachers, pupils and families across Northern Ireland. Obviously, sure. during, uh, sorry, I just finished briefly, Minister. During this time, obviously, schools have closed, and other than to the children of key workers, and examinations have been cancelled. <coughs> I've had the privilege to speak to many teaching and non teaching staff who faced extremely challenging and, frankly, traumatic situations as a result of these decisions. And many of them have been required to establish their own procedures and approach to school closures and continuity of provision due to uh, the timeliness and uh, guidance and support. Um, I, I would like to thank, on behalf of the committee, the teaching and non-teaching staff across Northern Ireland who have responded to this emergency with courageous and innovative service and leadership. And I'm glad, Minister, that you have an opportunity today to provide a clear in-person update on the action that you and your department are taking to help our teachers, non-teaching staff, children, and families to respond to this unprecedented situation. So you're you're very welcome, and invite you to make opening remarks to the committee. Okay, Chair. I uh, so we're just addressing a couple of those points. I'll make this sort of initially very brief. I obviously want to give then uh, the committee the opportunity to put uh, a range of issues in terms of the officials. Uh, can I first of all say I would join in your comments in welcoming a lot of the efforts that are happening in school by both teaching and non-teaching staff, and I suppose schools also in terms of some of the decisions as a body corporate that are there. Uh, I suppose in addition to the educational provision and indeed in addition to the support that they have given, particularly for key workers, children and vulnerable children, uh, one of the things that is very noticeable um, in terms of the, the current situation has been, um, I suppose entirely off their own, but sometimes through discussions with colleagues, uh, of a large number of schools who have then, for instance, decided what can they do to make an additional local contribution to their local hospital, their local health service. And we've seen, for example, uh, schools doing um, a level of examination of what equipment they have within, this is particularly post-primary schools, uh, within their uh, inventories, and be it sort of particular masks, uh, aprons, various bits of equipment have donated those locally to uh, hospitals. I think that is very much in the true public spirit that we've seen uh, develop uh, within this. Uh, as you can probably appreciate in terms of uh, events, um, probably I think in terms of speed of events have been very quick. Uh, there, as I think probably things have developed, there are 
big peaks and troughs of activity uh, on that basis. And I suppose that has maybe been one level of, of uh, restriction as well. There are a number of items that uh, are still to be brought to fruition, which there's, there's work ongoing. Uh, we're probably moving in from an educational point of view to a slightly more settled phase in which a lot of the initial activities are then starting to bear dividends and are, are working their way through the, the, the system. Uh, that will mean probably the demands on, on time of a number, uh, number of us in terms of uh, uh, the ability then to be able to uh, answer to the committee uh, would be sort of, certainly on a personal basis I'll be uh, more able to, to do that. I, I, I don't want to maybe give encouragement to the, uh, to the clerk who will then be giving up uh, 87 things to, to ask us in terms of uh, budget correspondence. But, uh, look, I, I will try and make myself as available as possible um, in relation to that. And, and unless it's another event, I'll try and get along to uh, each of the sort of the, the briefing sessions with the committee. Uh, specifically, as well, in terms of the, the broader area of the assembly, uh, I will be speaking tomorrow to the, uh, the assembly's body corporate, to the ad hoc committee. Uh, I think that the way that has been, generally speaking, organised by uh, the executive as a whole is to provide not quite a rotation of ministers, but to try to get ministers there uh, to give you like, a range of, of updates. So to that extent, I think in terms of timing, not entirely within my, my gift, um, but I would do that as regularly as, as possible. Uh, I think in terms of the, the, the broader sort of updates, obviously a lot has happened in the last few weeks. Uh, I know the Permanent Secretary last week gave a um, fairly extensive update to you. Uh, also, I suppose in terms of the general comprehensiveness of the, uh, of the situation, um, we've obviously um, have given you then a detailed breakdown of the various work streams that the department I think covers all the main aspects um, of this. And, and probably it may be best if there, if there are questions probed um, to that. Can I say in terms of, I suppose, the, the structural side of it, uh, all aspects of the, of the department are continuing to work. Uh, what we are doing uh, to ensure that there's a, a close monitoring of all activities and indeed therefore directing activities where either as a department we need to do or alternatively we need to work with others to help deliver. Uh, we hold a regular meeting once a day uh, where, generally speaking by some in present, generally speaking by way of the uh, sort of remote uh, sort of communication, uh, where all the main officials are there. We deal particularly with uh, what is emerging in the wider picture in terms of uh, the um, broad contingency planning side of things, which is across the department. <coughs> Deal with any issues with regard to legislation, and we deal particularly with uh, outstanding actions and indeed the, the general work stream. So that is going on on a daily basis. Uh, obviously, as I said, which we'll probably touch on in this, there are a number of items which are present uh, work in progress. Uh, I suppose just to highlight, and I know that the committee has had the uh, different elements of this, uh, I suppose specifically because whether or not, uh, not legislation but are rising out of legislation. There have been a couple of notices that we've issued. Uh, one, to give us the direct legal authority for the redirection of the money in terms of the free school meetings, and I'm sure people will come on to that, because uh, what we've allocated and got then budgetary funding uh, will be there for uh, is then to direct uh, what would normally be spent on free school meetings directly into the means themselves for everyone who's entitled to a free school meeting. Uh, and we're obviously we're working with communities when they're giving a lead to that. It's been largely speaking on that element of it. The DE has been funded, has been funding. That is which is, is in addition, if you like, to uh, those who would normally have been paid as part of that process in terms of in terms of staff are continuing to be paid. Um, but we are in a situation where uh, that was one of the notices. The second area, which is unfortunately inevitably will have been impacted, and also there's a lot of impact um, given the current situation uh, is that of the practical issue of, of statementing uh, and the SEM situation and obviously in terms of notices which we've also notified you with at the moment the department in terms of uh, the assessment process is under a particular uh, duty to deliver that. That is obviously our hope and aim but I suppose dealing with the practicalities from a legal point of view 
uh, there's been a change in terms of the notice has uh, changed the wording of that to the department using its best endeavours uh, to deliver that because obviously some of the work that would be required during the broad statementing process is not one which is particularly compatible with the, the coronavirus. That's not something which I think any of us would want to do, but uh, that is covered by the notice. Beyond that, uh, I think uh, myself, the Permanent Secretary, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, all uh, was happy to get into whatever issues that you or the committee want to uh, start to, to go through. Maybe that might be the most productive way of, of doing that. Yep, thank, thanks, Minister. And as you referenced, the Permanent Secretary had provided us with a, a very detailed update last Wednesday informally um, with particular reference to the six work streams. Um, thank you for your update today as well. I, I think it is um, best to proceed via uh, questions from committee members, so I'll uh, go straight in and ask the Deputy Chair, Karen Mullen, um, if she'd like to ask a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister and Permanent, Se Permanent Secretary um, John for attending today um, to give us more of an update as this situation keeps evolving. I'm going to ask all my questions now at the start um, because, I, I was, because we're remotely, I don't think I'll probably maybe make it back in again. So uh, I'll try my best here to, to get through them. Um, Minister, in the update that we received, um, we have all probably been in touch with you in relation to substitute teachers' pay. Uh, you have referenced the hardship fund that the department is looking at. I'm just wondering if you can give us any detail on further detail on it. And um, uh, you know, would you consider? And I know you are considering all options. So maybe. Uh, payments based around average earnings or looking at the 80% retention scheme that has been introduced by the government as well? I'm oh, sorry, yeah, Karen, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, I thought maybe you were going to ask all the questions and then we'd respond to them, or do you want to just take it? I don't mind. I, don't mind. Do, I, don't I, mind. I, I mean, yeah, I, took it. I can certainly answer, start off by answering that one. Yeah, look, the department's put forward proposals in relation to that. That is with the Department of Finance. Um, I think that in terms of the scoping exercise within that, I, I suppose, just, first of all, to clarify in terms of substitute teachers, um, broadly speaking, they fall into, um, it's a slightly invisible division, but from a practical point of view, fall into two particular categories as regards yeah. uh, arts pay. Uh, yeah. Those that are have been on... Uh, effectively what you might describe as short-term contracts um, who are taking, if you like, and who are therefore directly in employment by particular schools at uh, the times the schools have gone um, uh, into sort of a, into a reduced phase, probably is probably the, uh, the most accurate way of describing it in many cases uh, are not open at all. Um, we have guaranteed to think, as with any, uh, anybody who's under contract, that those contracts continue. Uh, yeah. That is, it. Um, if you are a member of canteen staff, if you're a teacher, if you're a classroom assistant, uh, similarly, even in terms of the contract, the EA are operating. Um, and so, for example, if you are involved with school transport, if you're a bus driver or you are um, a taxi driver, the money should should be there for you. So for that cadre, and I think, roughly speaking, in terms of cost, while it would be um, slightly less than it would be a a minority of the, the substitute side of it, roughly speaking, that would be half of substitution costs are therefore directly guaranteed to those individuals. So if somebody has, has been covering from, um, say, maternity leave or long-term illness, <coughs> yeah. they are directly covered. It's actually, should, the one, it's actually no, five I, months. I know, I understand, yeah, understand that, Karen. So what we then separately have been doing then has been uh, drafting up proposals um, I suppose in terms of the detail, uh, I think the elements that you outlined would very much lie at the heart of the detail of, of our proposals. So uh, I think it, we'd be looking at uh, one sort of caveat at the end of this, which is very significant. So yes, I think it would be drawing on, for instance, uh, the current position, we'd be drawing on what uh, level of that, that teacher had done. So to take an example, as, as effectively the turnover point is really uh, the last three months of the school year compared to the first three months. So 
So we'll be looking, for instance, within any scheme um, at um, effectively what the average sort of um, uh, amount of work that was done during the, the January to March period, and therefore people's entitlement would be based upon that. I think we'll be looking, because of, there is an akin bit, at proposals which uh, would be in and around the, the, uh, the 80% type uh, situation. There is also the case that um, uh, I suppose within that, in terms of proposals, uh, so therefore it would also, uh, because they're already covered, exclude from that those who are continuing on with the full contract. Uh, also, I suppose, in terms of making up that money, if, um, although the opportunities for substitute teachers um, will be, by, almost by definition, incredibly less than, than what they, uh, they are present, there will be some bits of work that, that some substitute teachers will pick up on a casual basis. And certainly one of the things, and we'll get into probably later on in terms of the volunteering side of it, uh, one of the messages that we've been sending as opposed to schools in terms of the, the process side of it is, if you can't um, fill from your own staff or indeed um, in cooperation with another school, before you start maybe making a central appeal to, to volunteers, look at what availability there is of substitutes. You know, there's still the opportunity yeah. for people to bring in substitutes. So it would probably discount any earnings that, that would be got through that. And the other discount would be if something was being provided, uh, there's a small cadre of, of substitute teachers who would be on a teacher's pension already who are retired. Those roughly speaking about 5% of the, the overall bit. And if there's a scheme that's put in place, uh, those people would not effectively be getting uh, paid twice by the public purse. Um, yeah. The one caveat I would ask all this, Karen, is uh, this would add up to a considerable amount of money. The only way this is affordable is if there is provision and certainly affordable on the basis of, of that proposal, is if the executive and the Department of Finance uh, sign off on that. Yeah. Uh, we have put in proposals. To be fair, I think um, there are different tranches of money that are getting spent uh, by the executive and are being greenlighted by finance. Uh, we haven't as yet got a green light for the substitute teacher's side of it. Uh, it remains to be seen whether we'll get a, a green light or not, because yeah. it is the case while there's a large amount of money has been made available to the executive, particularly by way of Barnett Consequentials. Uh, there are very large demands on that. So it, it's not, yeah. if you like, a fair question of, here's, here's a sort of a proposal, um, right, you know, let's just get sort of sign off of the, uh, it's got to be prioritised by DOF, uh, by the finance minister and by the executive. And clearly there will be question marks of whether or not ultimately that will happen. But we have put that in as, as one of our bids. No, great. Thank you. Karen, 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 just before you go to your, Karen, just before you go to your next question, sorry. Uh, so we have nine members to ask questions this morning. Okay. Um, I've watched mm -hmm. other committees really f find it challenging um, to get through um, all the questions they would like to get through in this format. So I would yeah. make a particular ask. This is not just that you, Karen, by the way, by any means. Um, uh, in, fact, in fact, your question was very concise. It's for the members and the minister. Please, know, please, gonna... please, please, please um, err on the side of extremely concise questions and extremely yeah. concise answers, okay? I think that uh, sure, question... I, 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 the... I, think, I, think, I think you refer to the vice chair. That's probably a lot more vice pop than it is. It, person, well, that I mean, just, just to recap... Given the significance, yeah. given the significance of the issue, <laughs> No, I, I, I appreciate that, Minister, but I think, in effect, the question there was an update on progress for, for a hardship payment for non-employed substitute yeah. teachers. That's a concise yeah. question, well put. We need concise answers as well, Minister. I, I don't mean to be um, harsh here, but in this format, in this format, in this, in this format we need to really stick to that. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to ask the, the next couple um, together uh, and, and some of them will be points more than questions. The first one is around the personal protective equipment and just if we can get an update if there is, if there will be a supply for one day school uh, for teachers and volunteers. Um, Catherine will cover the, the child care stuff but just wanted to raise a couple of points with you Minister. Um, the department had asked Constable to comp compile and complete volunteer forms and then yesterday, the Education Authority sent out the principals also to complete. Um, there seems to be a bit of duplication happening here. 
Uh, and it's just that, as you would be aware, you know, um, teachers and particularly principals are very busy and very stressed at the minute. Um, I suppose in terms of the childcare, you know, we're been here, we're hearing that there's 200 childcare places through the Belfast Trust, as there's still a need to be asked in schools to open. Um, yesterday, as I say, I was in schools here in the city, visiting some of them. They're all working work very, very hard um, and providing support to pupils and families at this time. So I just want to say to you, it's vitally important that principals in particular get a break over Easter. This is going to be a very long period. And I would ask that the Department of Education Authority take this on the account and review what requests and correspondence is going to be asked of them over the next week or so. I understand we're in an emergency situation and people need to be on hand, but I do believe that they, they, they need a break and I would ask that that be considered um, because they're all still in school where naturally some of them would be already off for, for Easter. In relation to free school meals, it is great that we have seen that the money is already getting out. But one issue that has come up, and you may be aware of this, is for asylum seekers. Um, I've been contacted by one school in Belfast that has 19 children who are asylum seekers. They don't have a bank account, Minister, um, and uh, so they won't have any provision either to be able to cash and check. They haven't received any um, payment as such. The principal has been advocating for them and contacted the Education Authority, who has told them that, um, as, as far as they know, they're as frustrated that they're saying that it's the British Home Office that is holding that up. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or working on it, but um, can you give me an update on that? Okay. Well, I think we'll, we'll, take, we'll tag team this a little bit, Karen. Uh, I think, obviously, DSC is a particular role in the sound figures. Uh, Derek? I suppose can deal with that. I just want to deal with a couple of the issues. First of all, the fact I think three main issues. Uh, yeah, if, look, if there's any duplication of yeah. um, of being sort of uh, seeking information, we'll try and iron that that out. Um, on the the issue of a, of a break, one of the things that we said in the advice on this, uh, look, I think sometimes some schools feel if they are open providing that service, that the principal has to be there the entire. One of the things that we've made fairly clear is. There needs to be probably somebody in charge, but that can be drawn from a principal, a vice principal, a senior, um, somebody from the SLT. In a lot of cases where they are open, there's a very minimal number of, of pupils, so there, you know, it isn't something that, that needs to have a a principal there all the time. Indeed, for much of the time, what I would say in terms of break, I think that's about, and I think a lot of schools have used rotation of staff, and I think that's also ha should happen in senior leadership. I think, I, I think the only complication. Uh, with the having a break uh, issue is if we are expecting a lot of this to peak over the Easter period, then there will be some of the days when actually the schools themselves will be most needed um, to be able to soak up the, the, the pressures in terms of key school workers. But so there's a need to do that. We have asked, we asked in terms of, and there's different, we'll come on, I suppose it's a later stage to uh, the way this is done. But in terms of the, um, the process side of it, uh, there was a large number of schools who have come back to us effectively volunteering to be open over the Easter period. There are some schools which I think have volunteered to be open uh, over weekends as well. So a lot of this is actually also being driven from uh, a desire from the ground up to be able to provide that, that side of it. Two other issues then, on the childcare side of it, valid point, we have a, a, a submission again in terms of finance, um, which again will be dealt with very soon. Uh, in relation specifically to childcare with a specific childcare scheme that ourselves and the Department of Health have, have worked on. Um, we're making a little bit of adjustments to that, but that should be in a position that things can move forward not very quickly, depending upon uh, executive executive funding. So I, I think that there'll be a better story there very soon. On the PPE equipment, uh, we've been working with PHA. We've given, obviously, particularly social distancing advice, and there's also been a general bit. But there has been, I think, um, uh, we have details in terms of the PPE stock, which has been uh, has been both obtained and now delivered uh, by uh, the Education Authority. So, I mean, for instance, um, there are, in terms of uh, overall delivery, um, there are, for instance, um, 18,000 uh, 18, 343 bottles of uh, stock have been obtained in terms of hand sanitizers. There's been about five and a half thousand that have been directly delivered. 
Um, and I think a large number of those bottles have just uh, recently arrived, so they'll be delivered as well. Um, we've got two and a half thousand gloves have been delivered. Uh, again, with more stock that's available, um, we've had like 60 face shields, 5,000 dis uh, disinfectant wipes. Um, we've had um, around about sort of 180 by 51 containers of disinfectants. We've actually had 32,000 aprons delivered uh, to schools. So, uh, as you can probably appreciate, there's a lot of stock initially um, yeah. across the board. Uh, that health got a particular priority, and I understand, for instance, the, the stuff that's come from London is entirely for health. But there has been, I think, some level of, of uh, procurement with CPD that has gone on uh, for non-health. We've got our, our share of that. EA are delivering that, and they have some other uh, elements that's in Scotland's an ongoing process. But I'll bring in Derek okay. to start the uh, okay. the Okay. Uh, good morning, Karen. It's Derek here. Uh, just, just on the free school meals, as you know, we had about 97,000 children to cover. In the first yeah. wave, we were able to get the money out very quickly because we had bank account details for over 94,000 of them. Then we tried to communicate with parents whose bank account details we didn't have. That's managed to capture most of the rest. But you're absolutely right. There is a small number of children measuring in the hundreds. Um, in the categories of asylum seekers and perhaps Roma and travellers whom we haven't been able to contact or get bank account details for. So we're engaged with the Department for Communities in the context of Minister Harkey's efforts to get food parcels delivered so that we can identify those children, identify their addresses and get food to them. That is work that's currently underway. So we haven't forgotten those people and the asylum seekers are a specific group that we are targeting. Um, we are not dependent on anything from the Home Office on this. We are dealing direct with the EFC on it. So, yeah, say that, say that possible in Belfast. It seems to have a high uh, number of children. Should I tell them to get in contact with the Department directly? Yeah, I mean, I'm quite happy for, for that, Karen, to happen. Um, as I say, we are we're engaged with the EFC, so if they want to get in touch with the Department directly, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. I'll just double check on that. Um, and uh, just I suppose, Derek, it was a, a point that I raised with you last week, and then correspondence that I have had back in relation to the pathway fund. Um, and I got correspondence yesterday just to say around the process. Look, um, Minister, this is really for yourself. I am appealing that you to reconsider the 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 forward plan in terms of pathway. Um, uh, in the correspondence, which you highlight the pathway fund services for the most vulnerable children and staff, or vulnerable children, and staff who are funded through the, the are child care workers and preschool workers. Um, as we know, preschools are closed, um, creches are closed, and the child care sector is nearly decimated. They, have, they are the lowest paid uh, some of the lowest paid staff that we have, they have no opportunity to apply for another job. So if these organisations lose this funding at this time, there's no other options left for them. Um, so I am appealing that you would just, yeah, just, just funded they roll on, Minister, during this period, and then, you know, after this period, so we're then, um, you know, then look at the process going forward, like we have with other Tranches of yeah. funding because we're going to push people into further poverty. Uh, three points just in relation to that. I think we're mindful uh, in the broader level on the, on the child care side of it that, uh, in terms of sustainability, particularly of the uh, child care providers, uh, and indeed part of the proposal that we have with DOH, a large element of it is actually based around a sustainability and b around uh, trying to if you like, help provide a service which child care providers can stay open and actually provide that, that key worker uh, side of it. On the broad element of third party organisations, including Pathways, uh, you know, again, as we come to the, there'll be some final details to work out as regards to the budget, but certainly the intention in terms of the overall quantum that is there, be it on Pathways or indeed other third parties, but is to roll over and try to make sure then that there aren't any reductions in terms of the overall amount that, that's spent. So if 
if organization A has been receiving in general half a million pounds for something, the aim would be that for twenty twenty one they continue to receive that half a million so there's you know uh, I think if we continue the overall context of budget, hopefully we'll be able to give comfort to those third party organizations uh, in the very near future in relation to it, but there's no intention to make any cutbacks or anything of that nature. Right, okay. I suppose it might, maybe it's just a wee bit of confusion on that. Uh, just for an example, like there's a local community press here, and um, they received a letter last week that they had been involved in the lost the funding. And there's quite a number of other people who have contacted me to do this. And that's just my sister. Um, they, they, they staff, so they don't know well they're going to have staff for London. They don't know well they can have money in the next few London, um, or you know, do they keep paying them? So we definitely need some sort of as a trade or yeah, Carrie, you're 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 breaking up there quite a bit, but look, we have we have guaranteed that everybody within the sector, including third party organizations, that it is rolling forward, um, as we speak. Uh, where the issue would be is is if you like the twenty twenty one budget, but there's no intention to have any cuts within that. Uh, that probably means in different sectors uh, it's unlikely that there'll be particular increases in terms of in terms of money no, but there will no, be no. you know that, that there obviously in terms of individual cases um yeah. you know we can't, we can't directly uh, no. with sector, you know, the money for pathways will be there next year it'll be, on the, mm -hmm. it'll be at least on the same amount as, as they're present um in, in relation to that and the same with um other organizations that have, have received um, earmarked funds as well and that being yeah. a lot of the priorities of the budget because a lot of pathways from the queue by the confidence of supply is to apply. Whereas we didn't, as a department, we didn't get all that we were looking for. We got probably a little bit over half of what we'd, we'd asked for in terms of funding, but we would regard um, those sorts of funds as being a priority. And the aim is actually to try to maintain uh, you know, the, the funding as is. Okay, and okay, that, Minister, uh, Minister of Members. Uh, I'm just I'm going to intervene there. That that we we can't continue with this length of questioning or this length of answer and expect to get through everyone. Uh, is that you completed, Karen? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, can I bring uh, Daniel in? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to the Minister and Derek as well for uh, joining us today. I know you're a very busy minister, and I've inundated you with things over the last few weeks as well, and I appreciate the swiftness of which you're answered things, given the challenges. Uh, I just want to pick up on a few things that Derek last week mentioned, and uh, let's just follow on as well from what uh, uh, Karen Mullen had asked. But Derek last week uh, mentioned that uh, he had received, the department received advice that suggested there was no need for PPE in schools. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, on the back of that, given what you've said today, Minister, has that advice have you went against that advice now and decided that it was necessary for TP in the schools, or is it only some TP in the schools? I mean, if we're talking about TP equipment, uh, some of that will involve things like the hand sanitizers. Uh, there's been a very limited number of masks, and I think that uh, we will follow directly, and we've always indicated the schools will follow directly the PHA advice in, in relation to that. I think that would suggest that, that in many cases there's not a specific need for certain pieces of equipment. I think that's where and there, there may be a little bit of misunderstanding um, in relation to that. You know, where something is necessary, it would be provided. Uh, where we haven't, it will be provided. Uh, a lot of those things are probably on the level of significant but lower level. Which, you know, clearly, for instance, what we need in school would be a lot less than we need in the hospital board or for somebody doing domiciliary care, for example. Um, can, I, can I come in there? Um, again, it's Derek here. Um, the, the, we, we follow the public health agency advice on PPE or other equipment and social distancing in schools. And the advice as currently stands is that PPE is not generally necessary, as the minister says. However, Specifically, um, the Education Authority has been able to get access to some PPE supplies as a result of the work done by uh, various agencies, including Central Procurement Directorate in the Department of Finance, and where an individual school, and this typically would be a special school, 
might feel that it has a need because of the circumstances of an individual pupil, the education authority engaging with that school to see what equipment is needed. But the public health agency advice is very clear on this. We will continue to follow that advice as it evolves, as it's updated, both at local level and at national level. Well, Derek, thank you, and thank you to the Minister for that. I, I would just ask, really, that as Mr. School is aware of that, because some of the concerns that we are hearing uh, very much throughout my constituency and indeed others across the entirety of Northern Ireland uh, is that message isn't coming clear for special schools. Teachers are very, very concerned about vulnerable children uh, that's in their care and the lack of uh, PPE uh, provision being provided to them in order to ensure the safety of these children. And also, uh, it's almost assumed that the advice that was shared last week is the uh, blanket approach by the department that simply there is, uh, there is a belief that there is no need for PPE in schools. I don't think that's entirely relevant uh, because in, in, in these special schools there's an absolute need uh, for this equipment. I know you've touched on it there, Derek, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, that you have, but I think that there needs to be uh, communication with these special schools to say that, yes, uh, where there is a concern for these vulnerable children, that we will provide the necessary PPE as required on a case-by-case -case basis. I Okay, I will take that away as an action point to ensure that there is that degree of engagement and communication. Can I, can I supplement that briefly, Daniel? I've asked a number of times now whether the strategic leadership group for special schools, the special schools principals group, has been added to the COVID-19 working group for the Department of Education. H has it been added? Has the minister and the, de the permanent secretary met with the strategic leadership group is that not a way for you to deliver this type of communication efficiently um no i i, I would say not chair i would say it's better for the education authority to engage directly with that group and with the principals of special schools because the education authority is on direct drive with special schools um but I'm quite happy to engage through the Education Authority to make sure that those messages are communicated to special schools. We have a, we're trying to organise, and it is difficult, um, a meeting of the wider education family, which is a very large number of organisations, uh, this Friday, and I will pick up that point at it. I don't think the, the special schools leadership group is a member of that wider family. We're talking more about the arm's length bodies and the statutory agencies in that. But that's not to say that we're not talking to special schools and special school principals uh, constantly. So, so I will pick up that point about PPA. Okay, Daniel, any further questions? Uh, yes, yeah, just uh, two more, Chair. In relation to the um, special schools, it might, it might be appropriate because of the uh, uh, suppose, every case is different in terms of our children in special schools. There's no two uh, situations the same, and everyone's circumstances are entirely unique. It may be of benefit, particularly to the children, absolutely, and to the school, but, uh, to the department also, to carry out an individual assessment uh, of each of these statements of uh, pupils, just to work out what their needs are and to ensure that uh, their needs have been met, and also to ensure that the uh, necessary uh, steps have been taken to ensure their safety. Well, Daniel, yeah, I mean, look, I, look, I think working with the EA as well, we're trying to provide as much support as we can to any form of vulnerable group, particularly special needs children. I, look, I think realistically, if you're saying about doing an, an individual assessment of every child who's special needs, or indeed even every child's special needs within a school, particularly given the time frame that is there, and the ability, you know, there will be certain practical difficulties. We've got to concentrate where we can uh, on things on it. Um, Daniel, if I can just pick up, it's there here again. Um, yeah, I mean, f first of all, I think it's got to be recognised that there is a very, very small number of children currently in special schools. So a lot of the efforts from the special schools and in conjunction with the health and social services is yeah. reaching out remotely to their families. Now, that is very, very difficult. Nobody pretends it's easy and it's far from perfect. But there's a lot of effort going into that, and I think we've communicated with the committee on some of the efforts that are going on there. 
But there is a very small number of, of, of young people in special schools, and you are right, there will be a risk assessment done on each and every one of those pupils, but that's best done by the special schools. The department couldn't do that. I mean, there are 17,000 statemented children, there are 6,000 children who normally attend special schools, and we don't have it within our capacity in the department to do a risk assessment of each and every one. But that is being done at local level and hopefully provision made at local level. And all we can do is keep engaging with the special schools and supporting them. The other, thing, the other thing people need to bear in mind is while there's quite a large overlap, quite a large intersection in the Venn diagram, it's probably particularly about the medical needs and the medical vulnerability. And medical vulnerability is not the same as special needs education. And indeed, you may get a a child, for instance, that is in a special needs school, there's no, uh, nothing that would make them in any way more medically vulnerable or any more risky, uh, either to them or to others, because of that, you have others who would have, and there's others who would simply be in mainstream schools who would be quite medically vulnerable because of a condition, but may not have even any special educational needs. So to some extent, there's, there's, there is always a slight degree of mismatch on this particular, uh, this particular occasion as well. I appreciate uh, the answer that you both gave and the detail around it. I, I was focusing specifically on uh, those uh, children of key workers uh, that are in school uh, uh, and vulnerable and will need uh, that necessary support. I think, that, there, that, I think Daniel, that, yeah, there, there is there's a relatively small number of children yeah. who, maybe because of particular medical needs, who are key worker children who are vulnerable, that will still need to be in school or need to be facility in school. And where those are happening, yes, I think. Uh, those individual cases will, will always be, be looked at. I think there was maybe a miscommunication. Like we were talking, you're talking about the wider special educational family. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, th 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 that's all on that particular topic, but I, I want to touch on sub, uh, sub teachers pay as well. Da Minister, Daniel, Daniel, just before you leave special schools, very briefly, can I ask the Minister and the, the Permanent Secretary how many special schools there are in Northern Ireland? How many are open and how many are closed? There are 39 special schools in Northern Ireland. I don't have the detail of how many are open and closed today, but I can get that very easily. It's published on our website, uh, all the schools that are open. Okay, because we... also the wider, the wider picture, which we'll, we'll touch on, there's ongoing work to see if there's maybe reluctance to have a particular school open, whether there's any arrangements uh, that can be done in terms of clustering as well, on that basis. And again, there's a, there's a balance of stuff there. And, and have, have you engaged with the Health and Social Care Trusts um, to assure yourself that the health needs that are normally met via special schools are being met in the home if indeed there are a large number of special schools closed? In, in the interest of the the answer is yes. Yeah, we have an, okay. we're, we're working very hard with the Department of Health to ensure that the trusts are reaching out where children who would normally attend a special school and who have health related needs are continuing to get those um albeit on a remote basis um and that is work in progress chair that will continue it's not something you do once we just have to keep working at it and we keep trying to improve the management information i don't like use to use the term management information but the numbers around that so that we can get that assurance but the trusts have put those arrangements in place okay because that, that, that we had asked for uh, a response to that via correspondence further to last week yep and one other key thing that we had asked was for an update on the delivery of measures including but not limited to personal protective equipment provision in order to assist special schools to open now in the response that the department has given to the committee today in answer to the question of the provision of ppe to assist special schools to remain open we have been referenced to uh, guidance on the website of the department of education in relation to social distancing and that current NHS guidance is that where staff and children are not symptomatic, then no personal protective equipment is required above and beyond normal good hygiene practices. However, more stringent guidance applies to care workers, nurses and doctors who are providing patient care activities that bring them into close personal contact. Do you not accept that the work in special schools brings teachers into close personal contact with pupils and therefore 
a, a range of PPE has to be readily available to special schools if they are to safely conduct their work? Well, yeah, I mean, from, from that, like, again, circumstances will vary from case to case and school to school because, again, it, it, again it's, it's the mixture of actually the special schools but also actually the medical needs. And again, the two are not quite the same. That is why, uh, and we've got the, the detail of information, I think, subsequent to probably uh, sending that out, that, you know, there is a stockpile which is being distributed uh, sort of by the Education Authority. So, yes, there are, there is equipment available. And sometimes that may not be where it is 100% required, but if, if, if it can be accommodated, uh, we're trying, it'll try to be done as, as well. So, there is a bit of, again, we're following the NEPHA guidance and indeed any medical direct health guidance on that. I think I think it would be useful, Chair, uh, if we got the committee details of the actual number of children attending special schools and include that in the data that we give to you. That um, that, that is that is helpful, Permanent Secretary, but it it doesn't reflect the amount of special schools that are not open because they don't feel they have the resources to be open. That that's the key issue for me, and I know I've laboured the point of engaging directly with. The strategic leadership group and with Belfast Special Schools, but you, I, I'm endeavouring to avoid reminding you of the difficulties that special schools and pupils with special educational needs have faced when relying upon the Education Authority to act on their behalf in recent times. So I, I don't want to labour that. I want to listen to my own advice in terms of short questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there, allow other members if they want to return to that, and bring Daniel back in for his final question. Yeah, um, Chair, just, just uh, I, I was listening under there and then I got distracted. Uh, it's just in relation to teacher, uh, sub-teacher's pay. And, uh, and the Minister and I have been uh, uh, communicating uh, and others in the department as well. I'm just wondering uh, what, what, what's taken the Department of Education so long, given that Scotland has already got the scheme in place and how long it will be before it's up and running? Because quite a number of people are in contact with me, as the Minister will appreciate, and I'm sure other members are the same. Um, everybody's concerned at this moment in time, and uh, uh, I'm getting quite a number of some teachers in contact, so I'm just wondering how long that will take for something. Well, in many Daniels, it's out of our hands, and I explain the situation. If this is to be done to the extent that I think we would all like it to be done, it requires direct finance beyond simply the education budget. We don't have a budget line which would be able to supply yeah. that. We require, via the coronavirus uh, overall budget block grant, if you call it that way, we require money out of that. Yeah. And we cannot move on that uh, unless and until we get money from that because we can't pluck it out of, out of existing uh, commitments uh, in relation to that. You mentioned about Scotland. We're trying to tease out a little bit the situation because I've heard slightly uh, conflicting reports on precisely what is done in Scotland. Uh, but I think that that was... Uh, in terms of timing, I think was only done at, at the weekend in relation to that. I think England and Wales are in probably a similar position to ourselves. There's a di different situation as well across the water in the, the employment of a lot of substitutes. They don't have a substitute list. Quite a lot of this comes through employment agencies, which are in a slightly different uh, position. Uh, but there's not any delay on our part. It's the fact that we don't have the money, and we can only pay the money if we get this granted via the Department of Finance and via the Executive. It's as straightforward as that. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Obviously, as quickly as that's uh, able to happen, uh, the better for, for many people out there. And j just to touch on a final point, Chair, if you indulge. Uh, well, uh, final, final point, to, uh, uh, William's I mentioned last week uh, 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 about school sites, and there's many school sites that aren't being used right across the entirety of Northern Ireland and um, that could be used uh, for health purposes. Now, I note today, Minister, uh, and, and I'm not sure if it's your department or the EA that has decided this, but the Malachies and Belfast has been released for the use of medical staff. Uh, that's hugely welcome because I do believe that these sites could be utilised to the benefit of our health service uh, uh, and uh, obviously our uh, medical staff as well. And I, I've also uh, uh, mentioned last week to uh, Derek uh, around the use of these sites for testing centres as we uh, ramp up the level of testing because obviously there's a school in every 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 major town or as close to uh, as possible and I think that these could be utilised 
and very accessible as well, but also larger assembly halls uh, in very large schools. And we have many uh, that could be used as, I suppose, wards for uh, treating people with COVID-19 uh, in the event that this thing would speak, uh, spike uh, beyond recognition. So I'm just wondering, uh, Minister, has there been any consideration? First of all, could you enlighten us about St Malachy's? And secondly, uh, has there been any consideration uh, being given uh, to schools? And have you been proactive in offering up that necessary and vital support of that invaluable resource to the Department of Health uh, for the use uh, of our schools for COVID-19? Daniel, I think that point of view, we're always happy to respond to any request in relation to it. You know, I don't think, I mean, at the moment there is, I think, sort of one uh, sort of emergency facility in terms of an emergency hospital that, that's being set up. Those, I think, these are quite bespoke bits. I don't think you essentially go into a different building and do that. But if there's a request from health or anybody else for use of facilities, we're always happy to accommodate that. But I think, for instance, in terms of uh, there are various things that, that are well placed to provide testing sites, and uh, the Department of Health will, will pick and choose those. If they came to us and said we want such and such, we we'll happy to give them. The big current second, yeah. and then just quickly. Um, yeah, Daniel, very quickly. The arrangement between St Malachy's and the Matter Hospital was just a local arrangement. We are aware of it, but it was a bit of generosity on the part of St Malachy's. At a general level, um, a couple of weeks ago, we did engage with the Department of Health to identify what potential premises on the wider education estate could be made available if the Department of Health wanted it, and that offer remains. We did identify some sites, but as the Minister says, we'll stand ready to respond to any request. The Department of Health isn't asking us for anything at I, present. I think, to be fair across the wider piece, I don't think... I think whatever responses are needed there from, uh, in terms of ours, but from a health point of view, certainly at the moment, I don't think lack of premises is really the, is really the problem, to be perfectly, perfectly honest on it. Okay, thanks. Can I bring William Humphrey in? Is that okay? Can take the remote ones first? The remote? Okay, no problem. Um, well, Robbie, do you want to come in briefly? Yeah, or or ask okay. your question? Yeah, yeah okay. Go ahead. Mind. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank Peter Derrick and John for giving their time this morning. And I just want to thank the Minister, actually. Um, I genuinely think why we might disagree on something sometimes, his availability and his, um, his willingness to answer questions at short notice is commendable. And I thank him for the, his leadership at this stage. So um, just a, I read out of maybe three questions, guys, and I'll not hog it too much. And if I read out the three questions, and then you can come back to them um, as, as, you, as you take them, if that's OK. Um, so they will touch on some of the issues that we've talked about. So just for some clarity, please on free school meals, so for parents of pupils who didn't traditionally um, avail of free school meals, who um, perhaps their, their, uh, their, their kids went to school with a packed lunch, would they be eligible uh, for the payment and would the Minister consider continuing something like that when we recover from Covid for those people who haven't, haven't traditionally availed that free school meal service? Um, uh, this is the second question would be in regard to the strategy for uh, GCSE exams, ASs and A levels. Um, I, I know there's only a little evidence of this, but in terms of how we're, um, the grades are going to be allocated, is there any provision for the different learning styles, particularly between girls and boys, in terms of that longitudinal uh, performance through either exams or their continuous um, uh, assessment? Um, the third one. Um, Easter uh, has become Minister a time when a lot of parents of pupils start to prep for AQE. So perhaps um, <clears throat> you could give us an update on what discussion um, has been had with regard to AQE, uh, the provision and, um, and some clarity for schools um, with regard to that. Um, I'm going to ask just one more question, um, if that's okay, guys. I'm just looking at a graph here with regard to the number of schools that may be open at Easter. And um, there's not a, a, it seems to be around about a quarter of the schools are showing a willingness to open at Easter. Um, and that seems slightly low, but I understand why there may be a reluctance. I think uh, the, the Deputy Chair talked on this earlier. But with regard to the Easter opening and potentially summer opening, could the Minister just um, outline if there's any thought being given to the, the, the contractual obligations in terms of teacher pay and any extra remuneration that that might. Um, uh, Qualify for for those teachers that actually are going to provide that. Okay, just times. I'm trying to touch you. I'll, I'll maybe leave the free school means bit to uh, to Derek. Actually, the figures in terms of the those schools that have 
of the dens remain open, certainly, as this would normally be part of the process. It's actually, I think, there was an initial response in terms of the willingness. That actually has burgeoned. So the latest figures we had, I think, 387 has gone up since then. Just over 400 were open yesterday, Robbie. Okay, thank you. That would be around about, close to about 40% of schools that were open. Obviously, in terms of moving on, as we look towards the summer, we will have to play that a little bit bigger, according to Jamie. On ATE and also the PPTC, PPTC, the GL assessment, their intention, as we've spoken, is to carry on, I think, with the normal timing. But those are scheduled for November. So it is a reasonable bit away. And I think that they'll be working upon, I think there are contingency plans that they'll be working on if that is not possible. You know, as things stand at the moment, it looks likely that those will go ahead. I suppose it would need to be reassessed if we moved into some sort of situation of a second wave within that. The, Derek, what was the other issue? Sorry, just could I go back? Yeah, DCSE, yes. I think some of the things that we looked at, we're in a position, there's been a lot of intense work that has gone on, particularly by CCEA, by departmental officials, and there's work that is being finalized also with main stakeholders within that. And we should be in a position to come to that conclusion very quickly. I hope to be able to say something, at least in broad terms, a little bit more tomorrow to the assembly. And we'd hope to be in a position that, again, unless there's a particular problem that emerges towards the end with the sort of the broader stakeholder engagement, we hope to be in a position that all the details of that will be soon released to schools within that. That's nearing completion. We're not just absolutely there yet, but it's very close to completion. Derek, do you want to pick up on the leads? Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, anybody who is eligible for free school meal and who has applied for it, the payment will be made even if their children don't generally avail of the free school meal and bring their own packed lunch. But it will have to be someone who has gone through the process, applied, and been deemed to be eligible. Yeah, thank you for that. Just want to, if that's okay, just to go back, just Minister, just for a wee bit of clarification on two points. So the question with regard to the schools opening at Easter, I suppose that the main crux of my question query was for those teachers that will be working over what is usually a holiday time, will they be given something like toil? Will there be any extra remuneration? And the other thing with regard to the exams then is for those pupils who who markedly and um, and probably through evidence through the, their teacher assessments will be able to say that they actually perform better in exams as opposed to the continuous assessment. That was that just that surety that that will be encompassed um, when grades are awarded. Well, there, all all the issues will be dealt with in relation to that. Obviously, in terms of a process point of view, in terms of exams, the other thing that we've got to ensure there's compatibility with across the board is that we're our pupils are put on a level playing field with. Uh, those who, particularly from England and Wales, as regards uh, GCSEs and uh, Scotland when it comes to A levels, uh, because obviously that's a gateway, particularly to university, to higher education, etc. Uh, so, uh, examining what precisely happens as part of that will be part of the overall package, but that package will uh, emerge uh, on the basis of um, uh, you know the broad elements of. I mean, Teachers are still getting paid, even if it's over the Easter period. Uh, the amounts are relatively, you know, there's a good number of cohort of of, um, uh, of teachers that are in, but by the same token, it's probably on any one day, maybe about five percent of the overall teaching profession within within that because there's rotation. So look, we'll look and see if there's any particular consequences that that arise out of that. But people are still getting uh, full pay, and full pay runs 12 months of the year. I think, Robbie, just to supplement that last point, I mean, we're very conscious of that, that everybody does need a break around this. And, you know, I would expect, although this is a matter for individual schools, that the efforts that are being invested in remote teaching and learning will decrease during the Easter period as they would normally. But it is in recognition of the fact that the teaching workforce and school leaders need support that we have put in place the volunteering arrangements and we hope to deploy those and we're working hard at local level 
um, with the linked officers to see if we can put in place the clustering of schools, which is again aimed at improving resilience. But I do take your general point that with schools, um, or a number of schools opening over the Easter period to support key workers and vulnerable children, they're being asked to go above and beyond what they normally do, and I'll take that point away. We'll have to reflect on that. Derek, you just mentioned there, and, and again, this, this graph that I'm looking at is probably out, out of date, but it, it seems to me that um, the willingness to accept the help of volunteers, uh, uh, was the, the, the greater answer is no, that most schools aren't willing um, to accept volunteers as help, probably down to a risk assessment. I think, I I think, I think you're referring to, there's, there's probably two points there in relation to, for most schools, uh, they don't they don't need to feel like any additional help. I mean, the idea of the volunteers is to have basically a pool of people who, if needed, can be there. But for the vast bulk of schools, they're not that are open. They are not at the level where they are under such severe pressure that they are completely short of staff because it's a relatively small number of staff that that are in that are needed to be in. Uh, and a lot in terms of the individual uh, pressure. I spoke, for instance, to one of the school principals during the week, who said that their policy was that. Uh, they were asking people to come in once every seven days in terms of in terms of staff, which also then gave a bit of a, a break in case there was there was any issues around uh, anybody picked up any self isolation during that, that period or whatever. So uh, most of them are. Uh, there will be some schools as well who certainly, if they feel that they can they can cope, their view will also be that if at all possible, they would prefer their own staff to be in because that will be the familiarity of the pupils on that basis. So, you know, the volunteering is, I suppose, really to provide, uh, if you like, a pool of people to deal with all situations. And I suppose particularly, which again, they, we may come on to, uh, in a few particular geographical locations where there will need to be work, and is there ongoing work by the EA, to look at additional school provisions within the area, because there's, call it sort of a black spot, or a gap within the, uh, the market. Yeah. Geographical is relatively rare, but some of those would, would also use then teachers from a range of schools. Yeah, I think, and just another quick quick point, Robbie, on the numbers. Uh, of the schools that are open, the most common number of pupils attending is zero. That's the mode. And the average number of pupils is two. And I know averages can be dangerous. The, um, the range is from zero to 19. So there was one school with 19, and it goes down one with about 15, one with 14, down to about 10. The most common number of pupils in any school is zero, uh, and after that, one and two. We should also put putting the statistics in a little bit of context as well. The overall figures, which will give how many are in, in any particular day, there are ultimately more children that are being facilitated because for a lot of parents, it's not a question of the child being home five days a week or no days a week. In quite a lot of cases, what what particular key worker bits have, have said is we can accommodate, uh, you know, at home. The child being at home three days a week, but we need on a Monday and Tuesday the school. So yeah. uh, it's quite often the, the individuals who are there will actually vary quite a bit from day to day on that regard. So the overall number of children that are catered for ultimately are larger than the individual numbers in, on any particular day. Okay. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I welcome the Minister, and, uh, Derek, and John. Thank you for, for joining with us. Uh, Look forward, Minister, to an update tomorrow uh, at the ad hoc uh, committee. I suppose when you reach the, where I am in the list, uh, a number of the questions have already been uh, dealt with. But I, I would, uh, and uh, Minister, you will know the huge empathy that the committee, uh, having met informally uh, and met formally with the uh, leadership group of the special needs uh, schools, the huge empathy that the committee felt with them. I'm pleased that uh, PPS is now to become available, uh, and I would uh, urge uh, whatever the channels that uh, Derek feels are appropriate, that uh, channels of communication with special schools are, are, are kept uh, kept open. But I, I want to go on to maybe a, a group, uh, still a, a group of uh, vulnerable children, uh, Minister. And it's really around those children who have been uh, described and put on to the at-risk category. 
children who uh, benefit from attendance at school, not just for an educational perspective, but also as a haven, uh, perhaps, uh, out, out of a, a home where uh, they are regarded as being at, at risk. Now, they, they benefit from both the breakfast club uh, attendance and at these school meals uh, 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 being available, and we know where we are with those at the minute. The, the, the schools and social services work extremely well together, uh, is my experience, uh, around the children at risk. Uh, and I just wonder if there is perhaps any uh, effort being made with the social services, along with social services, to attend or to encourage attendance of children at, uh, at risk to, to actually uh, attend school. Yeah, no, um, th there is good work that's going on with the social services on that. Uh, I suppose on two other points, which, and they, you're right within that, uh, on two other points, I think particularly on uh, some of the food issues, certainly there's been communication with the Department for Communities that when they are looking at broader vulnerable families in terms of facilities of actually providing hot meals, uh, that they are clearly mindful of families that, that if you like, simply a, a payment going in may not be enough of a guarantee, and indeed there's got to be close liaison uh, with the social services on that side of it as well. I suppose, Robin, one of the other issues which is related to that, which would be writing out the schools, encouraging, uh, without adding to their burden, encouraging principals, I know some principals are doing this already, is um, using their, their knowledge also to be able to give information that where they detect uh, pupils that may not necessarily fit into one of the groups, that may not be on the register, that, that they should try and reach out to those, those pupils as well uh, in conjunction. Because I suppose one of the worries as well will be that there are particular pupils that aren't particularly on uh, official lists, but there will be a local knowledge that there will be a need for additional support. So we're, we're trying to liaise with, with principals on that side of it as well. Yeah, I, I, I would just add, uh, Robin, I mean, I accept your point fully. This is an issue of major concern to us, um, keeping in touch with vulnerable children. Um, those, those children who are in the at-risk group or maybe on the cusp of the at-risk group. And I think I mentioned the last time I was speaking to the committee, we don't want these children to fall through the cracks. So we have been working on this, but it is only work in progress. We will continue with the Department of Health and it's not just on the health issues, it's on the social services side as well. And we're working up more detailed plans with the Department of Health um, as to how we reach out and provide a safety net to all of those children. It's tough work because of the whole social distancing issue and because we have lost that physical contact, um, but it is most definitely on our agenda. And I think also, just interestingly, looking at papers coming out of Whitehall, it's on the national agenda as well. Um, with our colleagues uh, in the Department of Justice, not just health and communities, uh, so we will continue to work on that issue and hopefully uh, bring forward further reports to the Committee on Progress. Well, but, uh, I have to say that would, that would be uh, very helpful. I suppose the, the other area of concern, Derek, uh, is the... Ra uh, hello? Oh, yes, we're still here. Sorry, I, I, I'm getting a lot of interference. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the, the, the PSMI Wait, are reporting... Can you services uh, for you? Say again. <laughs> Uh, sorry, the, the PSNI are reporting a, a huge increase in domestic violence. Now, obviously not every home uh, where domestic violence is occurring will have children. But is there, again, any liaison with the PSNI around the children uh, and the, the potential of making use of school attendance? Um. Well, the, the, the current arrangements in place for children at risk, 
um, and who uh, and who are known to us because of their domestic circumstances still apply, and those outreach services are in place. But I think um, it was in the context of of you know what the, the point you've just raised that I mentioned that we are trying to develop uh, more comprehensive plans with our partners in health and indeed justice to pick up these issues so that uh, the, 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 these children are not abandoned in some way, you know, and maintain contact with the system. Now, children who are already at risk, we already have those on our register, and those services continue to, to operate uh, as normal. But it, it, it's really those children who are on the cusp of falling yeah. into risk. That's, yeah. that's, that's what we're worried about, you know. We, we, we will just lose that day-to-day -day contact with those children, and that's where we need to invest a bit of effort. Yeah, and, and I suppose the, the, the fact that they aren't at school doesn't allow the uh, school teacher to report where he or she may find uh, or have concern about a children's welfare, child's welfare. That's absolutely right, yep. yeah. Well, I look forward to whatever report comes forward uh, in, in that area. And thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Catherine Kelly. Good morning, and thank you for meeting with us today. Um, as Kjorn mentioned, I want to focus mainly this morning on charity care. Um, this crisis has highlighted how vital our charity care sector is um, in relation to early education economically and in ensuring parents can access work. Unfortunately, as you're probably aware, um, due to little financial support or gains, many have closed their doors. Um, this has resulted in many um, key workers not yet having access to the approved child care scheme, um, and also many key worker parents unable to find child care as their children are too young to attend school or the length of the school day is shorter than their shifted work. The feeling amongst many providers that I have been speaking to um, over the last number of weeks, they believe childcare has not been sufficiently recognised by relevant departments, and there is a risk of collapse of this vital sector if there are not interventions made immediately. Um, providers are crying out to play their part in this crisis and assist in the care of our key workers' children. Uh, child, the child care providers deliver an essential and highly valued service all year round, and they should be our solution to the solution to many at this crucial time. I believe we need to ensure that the sector does not fall between the students. They are the backbone of our society when it comes to early education and care for our youngest citizens. Minister, you mentioned earlier a support package for child care. Can you give us the timeline on when this package will be available? to the sector and can you share any of the detail agreed within the support package? Well, no, I, I can't share the, the issue is that it'll be part of a range of proposals that, are, that will be in front of the executive and I can't, um, you know, all I can say directly speaking is I don't disagree with anything what you said in terms of the importance of the child care sector. Yeah. That's why um, jointly with the Department of Health, because they would also have a role, for instance, in, in terms of child minding as part of that. Uh, why jointly there's been a proposal which was drafted um, a while ago, which has gone to the Department of Finance, which is waiting for approval for funding from that. But I would hope that that can move ahead very quickly, but I can't obviously preach some of the details uh, of that in terms of uh, the sort of executive processes, but it, it, it has been very clearly in our minds um, over the last week or two, and there have been there are proposals that are uh, teed up and ready to go now. Even if those are able to be announced very quickly, there will still be uh, a little bit of time that will be taken to put them into place. Uh, but yeah. again, I think the aim would be to move as quickly as possible once once a green light is given on finance of, of those. But uh, you appreciate that it is something that's, that is going to be discussed by the executive, so I can't really go into detail just directly at this stage. I mean, Catherine, I mean... You know, apologies for being a bit coy on this issue because, as, as the minister has said, the, the, these proposals are with the executive and will be considered yeah. very shortly. But the, the broad three areas that we want to look at, that means Department of Health and Department of Education officials, in conjunction with the sector and liaising with them, are looking yeah. at sort of three broad areas to ensure that, first of all, key workers 
who we depend on can go to work with the confidence that their children are being cared for um, and that schools and childcare providers can operate safely and have the necessary yeah. resources in place to do so. And also I take your point that we need to have a sector that's able to respond to the needs of children and families when we come out the other end of this crisis. And I mean, th yeah. those three broad areas are on the agenda without going into the detail of what the executive will be considering. Thank you, I'm glad, glad to hear that. Um, just one more question. Um, can we get some clarity on whether the Education Authority Board is continuing to meet during this period and how often they are actually meeting? I don't know the frequency, but the board, um, because it was due for renewal on that basis on it, uh, the various sectors uh, on arms act bodies that were providing people to that have all, as far as you know, nominated. So uh, the board continues in, in existence and continues to to function. I don't know the frequency of the board meetings on that basis. I, I, I mean, I, I assume it is meeting normally, uh, albeit remotely, but I'll come back on that point. Uh, I mean, that's a point of detail that I can check very easily and come back to the committee on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's me, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Minister, Permanent Secretary, just to, to supplement Catherine very briefly, she has articulated the importance of childcare superbly. Um, you, the Department of Education and Department of Health has made a joint bid to the Department of Finance for budget to fund uh, a financial assistance package for childcare. Um, we are in week three of lockdown. Um, as soon as possible isn't adequate any longer in relation to assistance for childcare. Uh, when do you expect to hear back from the Minister of Finance on that joint bid? And surely that that matter is on the, uh, an executive meeting schedule this week. Well, uh, I suppose from that, that point of view, I would expect decisions to be taken very soon. I'm not sure, I mean, uh, from the point of view of the chair, uh, I'm not going to disagree with anything that he said there. I suppose it's not, it would probably be a breach of the uh, executive bit if I was to discuss what items are on the agenda, even for the executive ahead of the executive meeting. But uh, I would hope that we would be able to resolve this very soon. Do you expect to be able to announce a financial assistance package for childcare this week? Well, look, I'm just saying I suspect that will be very soon. Once, once there is agreement on it, the, the elements of the package are all as we delineated as part of that, that package. So uh, part of that would look, uh, you know, in terms of what also, as part of that support, can be there in terms of the sustainability of the, the sector, as well as ensuring that, you know, it's, it's a dual purpose, if you like. It's both support for the, the childcare sector and also ensuring that, that uh, I suppose, as Catherine and others have, have said, that there's the availability then of places through that, particularly for key workers. Uh, because, to be fair, I think part of the complication is where is a school with continuing payments? Um, I suppose A schools tend to be part of the, are clearly part of the public sector. They're in a different um, situation. But if you like, them opening up actually doesn't incur any additional costs, uh, given that, that a lot of childcare providers, either voluntary community sector or private sector providers, um, given sort of some of the constraints, for instance, around social distancing, even if there was a desire amongst every parent and a willingness to have every child in, uh, that wouldn't be possible via social distancing and, and simply have a model which on a private basis um, that, that child care providers are open for a fraction of their, of their current cadre uh, wouldn't be economically viable for those, those as well. So it's a mixture of those, but I, I, I hope that there will be movement on that very soon. I can't say any more without, I suppose, breaching any executive confidentiality on that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in the close briefly, the, the the challenge is twofold. Like you say, it's key workers being able to access childcare provision, which is my understand has been a massive challenge, and the sustainability of the childcare sector, which childcare providers are telling me is at risk. So the the urgency of this matter cannot be overstated. Uh, well, look, and uh, chair, I am I'm very much gripped of that, and I hope see movement uh, very soon. As I said, 
the, the situation is, as Derek had outlined earlier in terms of the provision of um, of places, you know, it is whereas it is possible for a school to be open, sit and wait, if you like, for potential uh, uh, key worker children to come and none show up and effectively, you know, apart from probably a little bit of waste of time, they they there's no harm done. It's not sort of financially viable for a <coughs> child care provider to make available their facilities potentially on a different day, maybe have 60, 70, 80 children in, but actually on this occasion have none, or be it, if you like, have full staff costs for, you know, two children coming in, for instance. So it, that, that's why it was there in a different um, situation from schools in that regard, which is why it's been particularly problematical. But I hope there will be developments on this very soon. Yeah, and that, that's why uh, an aspect of the package, my understanding, is to propose approved home childcare arrangements, which would address some of those issues. But I mean, our, our neighbour in Ireland has funded the, the closure of childcare provision. That's the scale of investment they've made in, in their childcare sector. Uh, Minister, I appreciate you've said that you, you realise the urgency of that issue. So I'll, I'll pause there and bring in Morris Bradley. And if, if on a good neighbourly basis, any, any neighbour wants to provide us with additional uh, finance to help our child care sector, we're happy to receive that as well. Okay, Morris. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you, Minister Derek and John, for, for attending uh, this morning. I had a list of questions here, which I've just scored most of them out. They've all been answered. Uh, but w one query I would uh, be keen to find out from the Minister is uh, how soon will information be available on the appeals following assessment grading? And what form will that uh, that take? And I'll just ask a few questions here. There, there's a concern uh, in East London Derry and pockets of East London Derry constituency about the lack of schools being open over the Easter period and the lack of information out there on which schools would be available over Easter. Could the minister maybe throw some light on that? And also, okay. also as, as, as the rate as the decline in the number of schools open. A direct response to the pupil numbers. Well, uh, all right. Sorry for all that at one time. Yeah, I think. I mean, yeah, as we just on the, the three points, there's probably been a little bit of response where there's been some schools, for instance, were initially opened, particularly even say some post primaries, and they were getting nobody really showing up, and that's been, I suppose, a driver. To be fair, to some schools to say, well, there's not a great deal of need for us to be open. I think that's fair enough on it. To be fair. Um, the overall number of schools has slightly fluctuated. While it may be lower than what the initial figure was, uh, you know, for instance, there are more schools open today, sorry, open yesterday, at least in terms of the figures than there was on Monday. What we're actually seeing in some cases, that some schools that were not initially open have now opened. So, uh, and the numbers of, I think it's only dipped below 400 once out of the entire period. So, you know, th there's not been any sort of rapid decline in relation to it. Specifically in terms of geographical, uh, and I know that there's been probably a particular problem around Korean, for instance, um, is that one of the things we're working with the EA is, is to look down at the fallback that if we can't get a local cluster that is agreed between open schools, uh, that they look at creating what they call an emergency EA school, which would mean effectively the EA, along with um, some teachers, you know, would more or less open up a couple of schools in an area where it can then absorb that particular pressure. There's, there's maybe two or three parts of that where that is the case, and I think there's work ongoing within that. In terms of the GCSE side of things, I can't really say anything more directly at this stage. We're very close to uh, a completed position on that. Therefore, I can't really go into the detail ahead of that. Morris? Yeah, that's great. Uh, what about the, uh, the, the appeal process? The, the appeal process is part of the... If you, you mean in terms? Of, you mean from a grading point of view, or? Yes, no. From a uh, from a grading point of view, how how are they going to accept an appeal uh, if it's a grading uh, situation as opposed to an exam situation? Well, that will be part of the overall consideration of of um, how anybody then challenges a grade or appeals grade will be part of the overall package that, that's revealed. We're not. I, I don't want to do this piecemeal in that regard and say here's the reasons for this summer. But we don't know what's going to happen, you know, or we can't say what's going to happen uh, in the summer in, in relation to that. So it'll be part of the overall package. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Minister, do you know when you will be able to answer in relation to the appeal and the examination? Well, I think it should be relatively soon. I'm hoping to say more on that uh, 
tomorrow. Broadly speaking, I suppose there's been a lot of detailed work as yet in terms of any discussion with key stakeholders. Uh, there's not, I think, while there's been issues of small issues of detail, nobody has actually raised as yet um, any issues of principle in what is proposed. I think the last of those sessions is happening today. And unless there is something major comes up today, we hope to start processing that. There will probably still be, so I hope you're able to say something tomorrow. There may after that still be a little bit of finessing of detail before directly, uh, be probably Justin Edwards would write out directly to the schools on behalf of CCEA. That may be a, a few days. Hence in that regard, but that's the kind of time scales that we're, we're talking about. Okay, okay. Uh, Justin McNulty and then William Humphrey. Justin? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister Derek and John, for joining us this morning. We use a very hectic schedule, so appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to rattle through my questions and let you come back to me then, if that's okay. Um, I want to start off with a positive point. Uh, our Lady School, our Lady's Grammar School in Jury, who are closed um, to pupils, um, but their technology department has been opened and the teachers are uh, fabricating their own PPE, which has been distributed to the health. Uh, Trust uh, very effectively doing the site, so I want to applaud them for that work, for that, for that ingenuity, and for that open source production of uh, PPE. Minister, you keep referring to schools being closed, and um, I think it's an important distinction that is made now. Schools are open, supporting children's learning remotely, both by online learning and by physical learning packs. Um, and I want to ask you: Are you happy that teachers and principals are being supported uh, strongly enough in that um, assignment? Okay. The second thing is, is there, has there a risk assessment been completed in terms of for teachers who are caring for, for you know, the child binding pupils and for volunteers who may be coming into a volunteering scheme who are often going to be retired teachers who are older who are in the, well, going towards that risk category? Has there been a risk assessment completed? Uh, substitute teachers have been discussed, but I want confirmation that you have sought funding from the Finance Minister. And has that funding been delayed or has it not been forthcoming for those teachers who are casual on the casual subbing register? Um, if this continues, will schools be dependent upon to be open during the summer holidays? I know Minister already you said that teachers are being paid anyway. Teachers have holidays and have scheduled holidays. Um, they're not being paid to work during their holidays. So I want clarification on that. Um, Vulnerable children in relation to the evidence previously presented to the committee on children with uh, special education needs. You can can you give us an update on what impact COVID-19 has had on reform of that service? Has the minister any idea of the staff absentee rate in the education authority? How is that impacting supporting vulnerable children? And there's also been a historical issue around recognition of qualification for northern results. Can I have an assurance that no child in the north will be disadvantaged with the system of allocating grades? Continuity of learning. For, I'll, just, I'll just finish off, Minister, then you can go back to me with, with all the things in mind. Continuity of learning. Focus has been on continuity for those in year 7, P7, year 12, 13, 14. And the yes, focus needs to be there. But is there going to be major emphasis put on place on continuity of, for, for, of learning for all years? Okay, give him a chance. What ahead, feedback, Minister. sorry, just three more points, Minister, then you can go back to me. What, what feedback have you from teachers in terms of how the new normal? for education is working. Is there a mechanism for parents and teachers to feedback, both parents and teachers to feedback in terms of how this new normal is working, how that is meeting with their children's education needs? And I want to put major emphasis on the point that Robin has already mentioned. I mentioned last week to you, Derek, and uh, that is children's safety at home. I'm placing myself in the, in the position of a young child who's in a, in a threatened environment in his own home, and whose only escape was to get off the school every day. I'm putting myself in that child in his shoes now, I'm thinking that, you, that, that the, the minister or that the permanent secretary is saying that we've got a work in progress there to try and put a plan in place. And that, that doesn't fill me, that fills me with fear. It fills me with, with uh, all the wrong emotions for a child in that position. I just hope that it's more than a work in progress. I hope the more energy has been put into this to, deal with, to work with the statutory agency, to, deal with, to work with child lines, to work with Bernardo's to ensure that there's no child who's at home now feeling fearful. That needs to be addressed more and more urgently, I would stress. Okay. Um, and the last thing I want to say is there has to be major, major praise given to teachers, to principals, who have had to completely reconstitute their roles. They've become childminders. They've become uh, 
online teachers. They've, they've totally reconstituted. And I also want to applaud the kids who are, have been completely disrupted in terms of their, their normal, their new normal. And there has to be so much praise and appreciation for teachers, principals, and pupils for this new normal and how they're had to, to readopt and to reconstitute. So, Minister, if you can, if you can help me address those, all those issues in, or in turn, if you can. Thank you. Justin, uh, maybe showing my age here a little bit, but I'm a little bit reminded of the contestants at the end of the Generation Games. It used to be where there would be a, a sort of a large conveyor belt of, of uh, prizes would come past, and then you were asked to sort of remember them all at the, the end of it. So I'm going to try and as best uh, address that. Yeah, look, in terms of uh, some of the points... I don't like the analogy at all, Minister. You're not like that analogy at all. These are points I feel strongly about, and it's not about... No, like the best I, I'm, just, I'm just making the point, Justice... Uh, with respect on it, it's difficult. If, I think it possibly kind of about 11 questions that were there to remember all of those. I'm just saying, try and jump, I, I try and jump in, but obviously uh, as much as possible. Uh, and if, if Derek remembers any of the other points, if there's something I'll leave out. Uh, look, yes, I think uh, I would say that, yes, uh, I would certainly echo any praise of uh, schools, teachers, non-teaching staff who are delivering in very difficult circumstances in many cases, this is actually a form of remote and supervised learning uh, at level. So I, I, I wouldn't categorize this simply as, as child minding uh, in relation to it, but certainly they deserve all the praise. On the issue of qualifications, yes, uh, this is part of the thing where CCA have worked closely with um, the counterparts, not just within the United Kingdom, but also within the Republic of Ireland. And we're facing a, a global situation, so there are um, there is, if you like, that, that ongoing work to ensure that there is recognition of qualifications uh, across the board, and we don't envisage there being a problem uh, with that. Uh, on basis of turn over to the other point. Well, I mean, can I can I jump in, um, Justin? I mean, support for distance learning. Yeah, echo the minister's comments. You know, the, the whole school system, the whole school's estate, the whole school's operational model has been transformed. Um, the, the, we are trying to provide support to those schools who need it for distance learning. For example, I think I mentioned last week that the inspectorate is out there supporting teachers and school leaders where they need it in preparing resource materials, giving them access to resource materials, disseminating good practice. We now have a linked officer for each and every school out there to provide support in this and any anything else that they're doing. I have to say, as you have already noted and you mentioned our ladies in, in URI, um, schools are way ahead of the game here. There's tremendous innovation, tremendous imagination going on. The minister frequently gets uh, reports from individual schools of good practice that is happening. So I am very confident in what schools are doing by way of distance learning. I think that's a su success story. Um, on a few, just a few of the other points, Justin. Uh, vulnerable children, yes, it's a very valid point in terms of the, the child is at home. That's why we're working closely with social services and uh, and particularly with, with health, with PSNI, etc. Uh, I think whenever we're referring to it in work in progress, I think it's uh, probably what we're trying to convey as part of that is it's not a here's here's the solution. It has now happened. Yeah. We can forget about it. Yeah. It's the fact actually it's, it's a continuing process side of it. Uh, mention was made, I suppose, specifically of uh, reform. Uh, I think from a practical point of view, a lot of the reform initiatives, particularly the transformation side of it, has had to be put on hold. And particularly from the point of view of resources and staffing, have been, I suppose, redirected towards the, the crisis side of it. Uh, mentions be made of the summer. Obviously, as we move closer to the summer, there'll be a re-evaluation. There are no plans at, at present in relation to it. But part of the part of the purpose uh, to cope in all situations with, for instance, the two calls that we made in terms of volunteers is to have a large number of people that if we find uh, particular levels of stress that are there uh, amongst our teaching workforce, that there's a need and it may well be that in particular geographical areas, uh, you know, some areas will actually be uh, have plenty of people be able to cope, no problem. Others where it will go very, very short. Uh, that there are a range of options that are there. That if this is something that needs to go on for a longer period of time, uh, in connection with that, uh, you also make a valid point in terms of uh, teaching is continuing on that basis. It is a, uh, it is from that point of view. I suppose sometimes we've been referring to open and close, 
sometimes on the basis of whether physically the, the place is open, whether it's open for children in that regard. But in terms of the ongoing work, education did not stop at the end of, of March. It is continuing and will continue on, um, certainly until the, the, the end of term. Um, I'm trying to think, I think that's about maybe six or seven or eight of the points covered. Uh, if you just mention anything other briefly that I haven't touched on as yet. Risk assessment. Risk assessment. Risk assessment, if there's a particular issue for an individual child, then yes, uh, things we do. Again, risk assessment across the, the situation. Any, anything that's done is done in line with DHA advice. Uh, are we in a position really to go into each individual school and do risk assessment again? I don't think that's particularly practical. That's school leaders. It's for school leaders to uh, be able to uh, see and do a level of, of assessment on that, on that basis. Is the department or anybody else in a position to do that for a thousand plus schools in Northern Ireland? No, it's not a position to do that. That's just a practicality. Okay. Uh, any other issues? Just the substitute, substitute teachers, you're waiting on, you're waiting on uh, well, funding from the finance minister yeah, for the... So, yeah, well said, we, we've put forward a proposal, as indeed, to be fair, have a range of other departments, and indeed, I would say, you know, within that, there's been a range of proposals that have been put forward across the board, um, as probably even with the general budgetary process, what has been put forward by departments will far outweigh what's currently available in terms of the, uh, the COVID availability, in terms of finance, uh, but probably what we've also seen as part of this. So as yet, there's been no positive um, response. And I've indicated that in terms of a funding package, we are dependent upon getting that external funding. Um, the only other point I would make in a broader level, and whether it's for education or indeed other departments, you know, we have been in a moving situation. And we've seen even the last number of weeks of Chancellor uh, in London, where he's, at times he's come up, he's announced particular packages, which have then of consequences. So. You know, where we are today, where we are even at the end of this week, is not necessarily the end of the story as regards financing. So that will be, I think, an ongoing ongoing process. But yes, we have put in uh, we have put in a bid in relation to that. Okay. Can I bring in William Humphrey, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, can I just thank the Minister and the Permanent Secretary for their valuable time that they given us this morning? I would just like to thank, uh, as well, if I might, the principals and the teachers out there who are giving great leadership in the most difficult of circumstances across Northern Ireland. Uh, in particular, I'd like to put in record, I mentioned there, Dr Paul McBride, it's Malachy's chair, and the decision that he and his leadership team have taken to free up the school facilities to support the medical workers who are doing such great work in the matter. Uh, and I think that's something which um, we all should commend uh, and welcome. And also the North Belfast principals, the minister knows this, I spoke to him a few weeks ago, who had a phone around and ordered, gathered up all of the PPE they had in their schools uh, that, was, that they could spare and took it to the matter directly. And I thank them for doing that. I just want, all the questions have been asked, in fact, some of them have been asked more than once uh, this morning. Um, but I, I would just like to um, thank the minister and Mr Baker for the time that they've taken uh, and, and the work that they've put in over the last number of weeks. Um, it's something which we all um, should thank them for, working in the most difficult of situations, not just Minister Weir, but also Robin Swan. And, and it's very easy for people to be critical, but I think it's important that ministers follow medical and scientific advice. They are the experts. We have lots of experts in Northern Ireland. We're coming down with them, uh, particularly in social media. It's very easy to be critical, and I would just like to thank our local uh, administration here and the government nationally for the financial package that have been put in place across government to ease the, the burden on, on business, on families, on schools and so on. Uh, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank them. I have no particular questions because they have all been asked. But on a brighter note, I just want to finish with, and the Minister I am sure will join me in congratulating the uh, Hazelwood College, uh, Integrated College in North Belfast, which has joined uh, in the up for the Pearson Award for making a difference 2020, one of five secondary schools across the United Kingdom. And I'm sure the Minister will join with me in wishing Mrs. Thompson, the principal there, all the very best for her and her school and her leadership team. And hopefully success will come back to our wee country. So thank you very much, Minister, for all you do. And Derek. Okay, yeah, no, I, would, I would certainly join in those congratulations. And I've seen online as well uh, a couple of other schools. Uh, I'm probably get in trouble when I forget when it opens to the stadium is up for an award up in, up in Londonderry uh, and there are other schools as well so uh, you know I certainly congratulate all those schools who are up for various awards uh, and also the wider response that has been there for schools which have gone uh, probably as indicated in the initial remarks beyond simply the, the educational provision 
um, but has joined with the community in providing that, that wider community response. Okay, Minister, just in, in closing, in terms of examinations, um, uh, we've had two uh, questions raised with me in terms of how vocational qualifications such as BTEX will be awarded. Yes. Sorry, um, sorry, Chair. Um, they, we, we are working with the Department for the Economy, who in turn, in the same way that we commission SIA to give us advice on how we would deal with GCSEs and A-levels and other public examinations in schools, the Department for the Economy has similarly commissioned SIA regulation in respect of vocational qualifications, so the same process will be followed there. Okay. Uh, but that might be one for the Economy Minister to announce rather than the Education Minister, but parallel work is going on. Okay, because obviously there are some vocational qualifications sat in our schools. Yeah, there yeah. are. And, and we are covering those off, Chair. We're not ignoring those, and I mean, you know, and also, of course, there are um, a number of A levels and GCSEs undertaken in schools, which are awarded by English awarding bodies, and uh, some announcements have already been made in respect of those, and we're making arrangements so that um, both the schools and the pupils know what is going on there as well. Okay. One one particular concern, specific concern raised with me was. Um, understanding that a, a particular subject in the Republic of Ireland, a particular aspect of the subject, um, the approach of the awarding body there is to award everyone with a 100% mark. Um, has that been reported to you? And that would obviously raise questions around level playing fields in that regard. To be fair, it hasn't been brought to my attention. I mean, if you want to offline, if you want to send that, if you want to if you want to email us in details, we can raise that specifically with DCA. I mean, okay. I have to say, I wish you, I wish you went to that school, to be honest. <laughs> uh, finally, it, it, did, did CA scope rescheduling examinations to the summer? And if so, why was this approach not indop, adopted in favour of predicted grades? No, no sure, I, I, I come after you there just as well, if you, you just slightly after you're done there. Just. Yep, Minister. Okay. Uh, no, did, uh, early on, I think... Uh, if we go back maybe sort of over a month, uh, there were potential options. Uh, I suppose one of the things was, was briefly discussed was that I think the problem is you would need quite a lot of lead-in time. And the, we felt that, I think it was also a feeling from SIA, which I also shared, that the worst possible situation would be, um, if you like, hanging on to the last minute, um, you know, announcing that there'd be a postponement, then the postponement maybe wasn't able to be taken into account as well on it. Uh, I think the other, so that wasn't felt to be a, a viable route to, uh, to scope. You know, if it was, there was, for the sake of argument, a situation where, you know, in a, in a parallel universe, you were able to actually postpone something from June until December, that would be a slightly different kettle of fish. But the feeling was that simply pushing back by a month or two, you know, wouldn't give any level of certainty. Okay. And I also think that, that as part of that, there was ongoing uh, coordination and discussion particularly with uh, other UK qualifiers as well, because it wouldn't be a good deal point in SIA doing something uh, which then, for instance, the other examining boards didn't do. So it's got to be compatible with Ofqual. And I suppose particularly as well, there's got to be a level of compatibility, particularly as regards the A-level side of it, so that uh, whenever sort of universities are looking at something, they can have a broad comparison. It may not be identical, but a broad comparison between boards as, as well. Okay. Dan, is it in relation to examinations? Uh, well, it is, yes. Uh, Very briefly. Actually, in relation to a point that I raised with Derek last week, and, and he, he said he would go and look about it, uh, it's an, uh, about young people seeking to access universities in the EU uh, and wider afield. Uh, will, their, will their qualifications be uh, recognised as valid? Uh, Derek, you were to get some confirmation. It's just there's a bit of concern in relation to this out there. I, I, yes, uh, Chair, I'll pick that up. Daniel, the answer is yes. Uh, I think we have written to the committee on that. Now, it may only have gone yesterday evening, but we are determined that any qualifications awarded by whatever means this year will be universally uh, accepted on the same basis as qualifications offered any year so that this cohort will in no way be disadvantaged.
Um, yeah. I think I think we did I think we did write or are about to write um, to the committee on that. Um, I think it's available on page thirty one, uh, permanent secretary. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. I haven't seen. Yeah, I think we I think Peter Burns, our departmental liais assembly liaison officer, wrote yesterday to the clerk to the committee on that point. Okay, we'll follow that up then. Uh, Minister, yeah, just in. Mr. Fellow, point. Who's that? Just a final point, is Daniel here. Uh, I just very, want to follow on the school, school meals, Chair. Uh, it's, it's an important one. Given that many uh, uh, individual circumstances have changed now as a result of significant uh, job losses and other things in terms of uh, employment, uh, th that'll surely uh, change things in terms of eligibility for free school meals for various children. And so, the uh, permanent secretary has advised that anyone who has become recently eligible is going to be able to apply and avail of that scheme. Is that fair enough, permanent secretary? Correct. Okay, thanks. Now, in closing, because we have run over our time for the minister and the permanent secretary, we're extremely grateful for that um, and for the regular. I'll, I'll have to uh, leave at this stage because the, the dial in with the, the executive, I think the executive's due at 12. Okay. So I need to get well, things set up for that. Minister, I'm, I'm still here, Chair. Minister. But, uh, just you, very, very sorry. Here here all week. Okay, Minister. One <laughs> final, final Thanks question for me, very briefly, is okay. we, we've recognised the courage of our teaching staff. Are we going to be able to settle the fair teacher pay and conditions award in the new budget? Well, that'll be something again. There's work in progress today on that, uh, but I've given a commitment in terms of the level of funding that's that's there. So uh, hopefully there will be. Uh, Things are moving in a positive direction on that side of it as well. Okay. Well, we wish you well in your meetings with the executive to secure that funding to support our teaching and non-teaching staff, Minister. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Derek, are you still there? I'm still here, Chair. Okay. Yes. Derek, I, I echo our thanks of the Minister to you and your staff as well. Mm -hmm. Um, we thank you for the regular engagement you've committed to have with the committee at, in these important times. Thank you, Chair. More than happy to continue that. Um, I mean, there's a couple of specific action points I need to take away uh, from today. I've taken a note of them. I hope there's no more because my pen's just run out of ink. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in my office. Um, did can I ask you a question, or maybe the clerk can come back in due course? We give you a written update, and I know the committee got it very late yesterday. Would you like us to send that to you every week and highlight any changes from the previous version so you don't have to read it all again, but just highlight the updates? Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, uh, we, we'll organize that with the clerk to the um, I will chair. I mean, I was just reflecting on, on some of your opening questions. I will commit before I meet again, and I hope I'm not over committing to a meeting with the um, or somebody in the department with the strategic uh, leadership group of special schools. Okay. Because um, I, 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 I note your, your sort of passion on that point, and I mean, it's well made and well taken, so I will commit to engaging with that group. Okay. I, I think that's an important action point for me. Okay. Uh, excellent, excellent piece of news. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Permanent that. Secretary, thank, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Is that, is that us finished? That's us, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, members, I'll just ask the clerk to summarise any actions flowing from our, our oral briefing with the department. Thanks, Chairperson. Um, trust members can still hear everything. Uh, so I think what the committee wants to do is um, write to the department, uh, welcome the uh, Permanent Secretary's commitment around engagement with the Strategic Leadership Group, um, seek, as, as he's offered, an update on the summary document, uh, which is in tabled items. It's the first thing in tabled items, and uh, for the department to update that. Ask them about the Education Authority Board. Is it still uh, meeting on frequency, etc.? Seeking also an update on the child care package, which, I, well, anyway, seeking an update on the child care package. Also uh, encouraging the department to engage uh, with special schools around the need for uh, PPE. 
and perhaps also just seeking further update, update on the um, substitute teacher hardship fund arrangements and perhaps asking the department what the situation actually is in Scotland and maybe also just asking them for an update on vocational qualifications uh, when uh, that is uh, not as known. So that's, that's all that I could pick up, members, yep. unless I've missed something. Members agreed could with I, those actions or any I, comments? Sir, could I ju- yeah, Robin. Sir, could, could I just add to that uh, if... Uh, Maybe Derek could provide us with an update on the work that is going along on the uh, statementing process, bringing it into line. I think think Justin had attempted to ask that in one of his uh, miscellaneous items, Uh, so we'll we'll definitely follow that up. Any any other comments or members content? No, Chair. Can I also add, I would like um, the Department to update us in terms of what efforts are being made to ensure that there is no child unsafe in their own home as a consequence of this lockdown? Good question, Justin. Yep, we'll add that. Any other questions or members agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, members, I just have a, a small number of items of business that I need to get agreement on. Um, in terms of chairperson's business, um, can I just seek your agreement that we uh, note officially on our minutes our, our recognition for the, the courageous and innovative leadership of our teaching and non-teaching staff during this public health emergency? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Agenda item three, then, is matters arising. Can I refer members to the general record of the informal meeting of the 1st of April 2020 at page six, and remind members that in line with Standing Order 115, it has already been agreed that this is a complete and accurate record of proceedings, and confirm with members that they are content to note the general record. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. That's great. Uh, sorry, Chair, again, just, just to re-emphasize the point you just made, I, I raised at that meeting as well my concerns in relation to children on home, unsafe in their own home, homes as a consequence of their own, of the, sorry, as a consequence of the lockdown arrangements. Um, and I raised that with the Permanent Secretary, and I just feel that that should be noted. Yeah, uh, just for members' information, if you look at to page uh, 33, I think it is, they've, they've actually they've come back um, so that that issue, that particular, uh, there was a point that the member made at the, at the informal meeting about uh, collaboration with uh, Childline Bernardo's, etc. And they've come back in the final paragraph there. Well, I, I, I don't know whether it's a, the member finds that an uh, acceptable response or not, yeah. but they have responded. So, yeah, just cl- the, to, to build on what the clerk has said there, on page 35 of your PACS members, um, the department correspondence makes reference to uh, Safer Schools app, uh, a digital safeguarding and communication toolkit for school staff, parents and carers in Northern Ireland for the COVID-19 period that is being uh, explored in partnership with Anik Safeguarding Group. And then also um, it references Department of Education funding of £266,000 per annum to support Childline, NSPCC Childline uh, throughout uh, Northern Ireland. Um, to particular locations in Belfast and Foyle, um, and, and it states that although a high proportion of calls to the Northern Ireland helpline come from children in Northern Ireland, calls can also be rerouted from other regions in the UK. So it's really stating what is already in place, to be fair, Justin, and I appreciate your request is what, like uh, what additional like support, to... yeah, what additional support yeah, is being put I'd in like place. I'd like to see a more proactive approach being adopted by the department. We, we, we can certainly add that to our correspondence going to the department from this committee meeting today. Content, Justin? Yep. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks. Okay, then. Um, our next agenda item, then, uh, Clark, is correspondence. Agenda item five. Clark, would you like to speak to correspondence matters? Sorry, members, there's quite a lot here, so if you, you bear with me and um, follow along uh, from about page 24 of your pack, uh, it's just we, we've let this build up a bit and we just need to make it go away. So that at uh, page 24, there is a um, the usual summary note, and I'm um, just uh, chairperson, I've got to ask members if they're content basically to endorse what it says on the note with the following exceptions. So I'll now I'll, I'll drive you through a few, and if uh, 
uh, if I mention something that you're interested in or there's something that I've gone over, uh, just gone past and you're interested in, please do um, shout out if that's okay, Chairperson. Okay. Yep. So the first thing I've just picked up is at item 5.3, uh, which is on page 35. This is a response from the department confirming that subject to the approval of a bid for funding, it intends to operate a non-teaching voluntary exit scheme in 2020-21 and provide some information uh, on its operation. So this was something that somebody wrote to us about. So if members are content, uh, we'll forward this to the originator of the correspondence. Agreed. Very much. I think you've moved on. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, then at 5.4, this was a, a memo from the Committee on Procedures. They were going to undertake a review of legislative consent motions and uh, the relating uh, standing order. Now, they've since emailed me and said that they're going to postpone this, but um, just um, to indicate that with the exception of the coronavirus bill, uh, by and large, uh, Northern Ireland um, education is all Northern Ireland centric, so it's, it's been devolved for a long time. Um, not a lot of legislation has come to us from uh, Westminster, so consequently, um, there are there's very rarely that we have need for any uh, legislative consent motions. I've dealt with them in other committees, but never in education, nor would I usually expect to. So uh, could I, um, I suppose how we'll deal with this is that uh, if, if the Committee on Procedures writes this again, we'll think about it again. But for now, uh, are members content that they would make a nil response um, to this? Because, Agreed. Uh, Agreed. 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 Very really good. Right, Agreed. okay. Moving on then. Um, Thank you. Thanks, members. Uh, page 40, item 5.5. .5. This is about school starting age. Um, the letter indicates that the minister has not come to a view as to whether legislative change would be a priority for the executive's legislative programme during the current assembly mandate. And the committee is still awaiting um, other correspondence on this matter from the National Education Union. So, members just content to note that for the moment. Agreed. Uh, um, yeah, I imagine things will yeah. move on. Um, then we have it. Uh, thank you. Page 45. This is a response from the department. It's pretty lengthy on its uh, uh, progress in respect of learning to learn, which is the early years um, policy. And it also provides an interim evaluation, an interim evaluation of the Bright Start School Age Childcare Grant Scheme. Uh, and additionally, the department has provided terms of reference for the Children in the Education Transformation Programme. And it's indicated that it intends to bring forward legislation in respect of childcare admissions for the 2021 intake. Um, so uh, the department had been scheduled to brief the committee on the 27th of May. Don't know if that's going to happen, but that would be around new arrangements for childcare admissions. Um, members might also wish to note um, that um, the uh, Innovation Lab, would, uh, cast your minds back to whenever the department came and they, they talked about this. This hasn't actually happened yet. So this was, my understanding was, was going to inform the new childcare offer. Mm. So that hasn't happened at all yet. It's, um, certainly in terms of the correspondence. Thus, the time scale for the new childcare strategy is unclear. So, um, members just content to note this for now. Um, this has been added to our um, to be arranged um, things in the forward work programme. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. okay Agreed. Mem Thanks, members. Agreed. Now, while I'm at it, um, we've had a wee problem uh, with, it, with the administration of our correspondence. Now, we've received about maybe about 150 or so um, letters since we started up again. A couple of them went astray. This is entirely our fault. Um, I sort of picked this up and um, uh, basically uh, just a misunderstanding between me and my staff, but the, the fault lies with me. So um, that's why some of this correspondence has got a date on it, which is like back in February. So there were like three items which were um, affected. So we've dealt with that now. And just to be clear, there was still a separate problem with the department and the education authority. That, that's another thing. This was just something we did internally. So three okay. items affected. That was one of them sorted now. Okay. Um, second thing then is uh, page 134. This is from the education authority indicating, um, oh yeah, this was about the Protect Life 2 working group. Um, uh, now, a suicide awareness strategy for schools has not been developed under Protect Life 2 as yet. Uh, as you can see from that letter, now it was a few weeks ago now, uh, and again it was delayed. Um, uh, this is our fault. Um, but um, again, progress on this. Uh, the reason I mention it is that I think the deputy chairperson referred to this at one of our very first meetings about what's happening with Protect Life 2, and the answer is there at page 134. At that point, it wasn't a great deal at that time in respect of a uh, suicide awareness strategy for schools. So members can tend to note that for now. If, if I could suggest, if any member wants to um, 
peruse that particular piece of correspondence in more detail and, and propose a further action at a future meeting, we can do that. Oh, but otherwise content yeah. to note it for now, yeah, agreed. Yeah, no, thank you. Great. Okay. Okay, then at um, page one three seven is a response from the department providing details of schools that have <laughs> who that was. Um, that have cumulative deficits of around a million pounds or higher. Um, so an annex, it's quite a it's good annex also shows the deficits for all controlled and maintained schools. So bear in mind the budget. Um, we're hoping for a briefing on the twenty second of April. Uh, it, that this is quite an interesting thing to look at just to see the direction of school excuse me, of school deficits going forward. So members can tend to note that for now. Yeah, and we can return to that at the budget yeah. briefing. Okay, agreed. And then finally, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, that we have a, not finally, uh, page 166 is a response from the department uh, regarding the procurement of the Education Authority bus fleet. Um, sorry, it's somebody's dog. I have this problem at home as well. It's um, my dog, the postman has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my dog does this too. As, as it made several guests. Is your dog places. amusing frontline workers, Robert? <laughs> that's it, that's right. So, it's a hobby of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so returning to the correspondence, page 166, Procurement of the Education Authority bus fleet. Uh, Mr Humphrey had actually suggested that they give consideration to leasing. Um, and they've indicated uh, that an initial outline five-year business case for bus replacement was sent to the Department for consideration in late January, and that the detailed scrutiny had not been completed. So again, this may be something that members wish to return to, but for now, we can tend to note. Okay. And, Clark, is it appropriate that you could even alert Mr Humphrey in particular to receipt of that correspondence, given his particular interest in that matter? Yep. Agreed. Sure will. Okay. Members content with that? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Content. Yep. Okay. Totally good. Yeah. Sorry, members, there's a bit to go here. Uh, number 10, page 168, response from the department providing the terms of reference um, for its review of home to school transport. Also, uh, the deputy chair had asked a question about um, pupils living in mobile homes, and uh, the department and the education authority do not collect data um, on this. So it's, uh, I don't know whether the member finds it a satisfactory or unsatisfactory response, but they have come back on it. Uh, we were due to get a briefing from the department. It's in our to be arranged box of things that we will do when we're at the other end of COVID-19 around um, home to school transport. So if members can tend to note for now. Okay. Agreed. Okay. So the next one yeah. I just want to pick up is that we have a bunch of um, uh, bits of correspondence around SEN. Uh, one of these, page 195, is the Nikki report, uh, Too Little Too Late, um, which is a rights-based review of special educational needs provision in mainstream schools. Report makes um, um, produces information which I think the committee would have been aware of already, but there's also some information about a reported high level of informal suspensions, exclusions and timetable reductions for SEND children. I mention it because, I, again, I think it was the Deputy Chair who mentioned that one, but they also talk about mm -hmm. the educational psychology time allocation formula, which the Chairperson mentioned previously, and uh, it seems in this report they look like they've had about a quarter or more of the EA's educational psychologists have, have uh, played in and have, um, have answered. So, um, Nikki was originally briefed to shed uh, was originally scheduled to brief on the first of April. Um, that has yet to be rescheduled, but I imagine members will want to return to that. Um, so, if we're content to note for now, but it, it's in the list of things that we do when we, we come back out again, if that's okay. Um, Peter, as you know, I, I have communicated with you in relation to this this week, and, and uh, I'm delighted to see this report finally come forward, but I can't help but think that some of the revelations from the Education Authority in recent months is because they strongly suspected that such things would be identified by this report. So I think that really uh, it has helped, I suppose, swiftly bring quite a bit to the fore. And there's other things within that report that are indeed shocking and damning. Uh, that uh, this committee will undoubtedly have to return to in a very serious way beyond COVID-19. Yeah. Members, members, uh, are we open to um, keep a watching brief on the agenda for our meetings going forward and to try and schedule a briefing from the Children's Commissioner should it even need to be via teleconferencing on this matter um, if, if indeed time continues to pass? Because... Um, whilst our efforts are to focus on uh, COVID-related business only, um, that is a matter that I think many of us are going to want to try and return to as soon as we possibly can. So we'll keep a watch and brief on it for now, but have that as one of our, our priorities to return to when, when possible to do so. Agreed? 
Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah. Right, staying nimble. Right, on page 197 is a departmental response in respect of the SEND framework. So this is the new legislation, the new framework for special educational needs. Um, the committee asked about the consequences for the Education Authority and Health and Social Care Trusts if statutory timescales are exceeded, so statementing timescales are, are exceeded as they currently tend to be now. Um, what they appear to have indicated is this is apparently unchanged from the present. So the new legislation, uh, parents can complain, they can have a judicial review, but my understanding is that that's what they can do now. So um, they, they've okay. come back in that regard. They've also provided information on statutory, statutory timescales in other jurisdictions. Uh, has provided information on the SEND Learner Journey Project, which is designed to improve parental communication. And they've also indicated that they had planned to consult on the SEND framework around spring or around now, but this is currently well, obviously being um, reconsidered. So um, can I ask Chairperson if you're content to note this for now, and as I think as you've just indicated, um, reschedule in the future um, uh, as appropriate? But, uh, if members are content, Chair? Yeah, I, th I think that will be a, a priority rescheduling for us as well. Members, agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. agreed. Okay, Chairperson, members, there's now a bunch of responses around COVID-19. Just going to pick out some of them. Number 19 on page 212 is a response from SIA on its contingency plans being developed to address the cancellation of exams. Uh, the contingency guidance that they provided was, was quite high level, didn't really answer the questions. However, um, well, if I've understood the Minister correctly, he's going to make a statement to the ad hoc committee tomorrow, so perhaps all may become clear. That being the case, um, are they content to note for now? Yep. Members yep. content to note? And, Agreed. Uh, okay, there's a bunch of other things. Um, the other, only other one I was going to pick out was at number 29, which is at page 271. This is a response from SIA. Uh, providing information on its review of relationship and sexuality uh, education resources. Uh, just to confirm, Chairperson, with members that they, if they are content to seek a briefing on this RSE review and the hub uh, in the future when we're at the other end of, uh, of COVID-19. Agreed. 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 Okay. So, Chairperson, are members content? Or are there any other items of correspondence they want to pick up? I think Robbie. Robbie, go ahead. To chair, just uh, through any other business, I suppose, would this be, or just in terms of what's... what's our next item is for work programme and then any, any other business after that, so... Okay. Yeah. Um, is, is, is it correspondence related? Well, it may, it's, it's certainly something we've discussed uh, in committee before, but it's not to do with that correspondence. No, so it's, it's AOB, I, I Okay. Think. Okay. Right. Well, look, the, the, the members content with correspondence. Our next agenda item is forward work programme. Um, I can I refer members to the draft for forward work programme on page 286 and confirm with members if they are content to focus on COVID-19 issues going forward for now, with the exception of a briefing on the 2020-21 education budget on the 22nd of April. Great. Content. Um, I suppose the, the only other pressing matter and organisation that, that we might need to engage with is SIA on examinations, if indeed the the minister uh, does not bring forward greater clarity on that, which he may do, so we can keep a watch and brief on that as well. Can I ask members then if after the 22nd of April they want to hear oral evidence via teleconference with education and childcare stakeholders, uh, the teaching unions and childcare organisations? Yes. Yeah. Great. Agreed. So, members, it, Agreed. It's, it's not ideal, as you found out today, those of you who are dialing in. Um, it can be quite um, um, uh, unsatisfactory in many ways, but if you want to have a do at that um, after the 22nd, and maybe we can see where the land lies with childcare and, uh, okay. and teaching unions as well. Okay. I think there are a couple of issues there that we consider um, not directly COVID related, but priority issues um, that we'll keep a, a watch and brief on as to when we return to them. Um, and Clark, maybe that leads me in as well to our, our position with regards to um, scheduling of a, a meeting for next week as well. Um, if, if members are content with the teleconferencing arrangements and the arrangements that we've had at the Senate Chamber, then I do think it is prudent to avail of the, the weekly departmental update but we can seek to confirm that between now and next Wednesday. Is that okay, Clark, or do you need it to be agreed now? Um, I think they might be planning on closing the building, but 
don't know. Oh, they might be. No, okay. I just don't know that. Don't know that. Okay. Um, so are you, are you content to correspond with us between, before next week to confirm okay. whether we, we meet in the building or we meet informally via teleconferencing? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Members content? Yep. Great. Content. Okay. Um, next item then is any other business? Robbie, you wanted to come in? Yep. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so we have uh, certainly a part of our priority pre COVID was to do with mental health of pupils, and there's no doubt that on the um, when, we, when we land again after COVID, that that is going to be uh, at, at least as bad, if not worse. Um, and we have been told that there was ongoing work, uh, which would be, I think, programmed to finish by the end of the year uh, with regard to uh, sure. mental health and wellbeing framework. framework that they would have. Now, uh, I think there's a couple of things that are important. One would be to, to find out where that is at the moment and is it on target for um, December? And also, um, is there any cognizance being um, taken and any updated information with regard to any outcomes of what is happening now? I'm very conscious and I'm listening to some of the experts, in particular Javon O'Neill uh, from Ulster University, with regard to the ability for people to cope at the moment, including our young people. They're very resilient. There's a price to pay for that um, when, we, when we come in again. So we'd recognised as a committee um, the prevalence of, of mental ill health uh, in our uh, school age population, and that was going to be a priority for us. And I think it, it would be remiss of us not to ensure that that continues to be a priority and receive an update on that framework as soon as possible, Chair. Okay. Members content to add a request for an update with regards to the emotional health and wellbeing framework to our correspondence to the department? Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Members have any other business? No. Okay. No. Well, okay. The, the next committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, the 15th of April, um, with the required number of us in the Senate chamber in a socially distant manner um, and via teleconferencing. But we'll uh, await further direction from the clerk as to whether that remains to be uh, the most safe and efficient way to continue to do business in that regard. Members, content? Okay. okay, I put the question at the committee meeting does now adjourn. Members agreed? Agreed. Great. Thank Great. you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.